So, and we've got a great mix of people. So if, if, as I start introducing you, if you can join me on the stage. So first of all, from Cap Gemini, we have Ron Toledo. Cap Gemini perspective will be from an organization that does consulting technology outsourcing professional services. Ron is the Senior Vice President and CTO of the Application Services for Continental Europe in Capgemini. He is also uh, the uh, Governing Board Director of the Open Group. And uh, his interest at the moment is in app standard, apps rationalization, the cloud enterprise mobility, the power of open. Uh, and we love the O, don't we? Uh, slow tech, process technologies, the internet of things, design thinking, and above all, radical simplification. So please welcome Ron Toledo. <laughs> Next up, we're going to turn to IBM, uh, Andres Sokol. And uh, IBM, as most people will have their own image of IBM. Um, so if I say it's a technology services and product provider, you kind of get the flat. I don't need to introduce them particularly. Um, Andres is uh, Vice President and CTO of IBM uh, US Federal, and uh, he is also on the governing board of the Open Group. He's been a driving force behind IBM's adoption of federal government IT standards. He's a member of the IBM Software Group strategy team. He and his architect team have been responsible for helping the federal government move e-government into the on-demand e era. Uh, you would probably pronounce it differently than that, wouldn't you? the on-demand era, <laughs> and uh, his team has been directly involved with multiple high-profile successful government software and services engagements based on open standards. So different kind of organization, hopefully different but consensual views. Right. Third up is uh, TJ Verdi, where's TJ, from the Boeing Company, and the Boeing Company is uh, an organization of many parts, so I need to explain which part of Boeing uh, that TJ represents. <laughs> so, um, within, within Boeing, they are sometimes a vendor of products and services, especially on the military side, and sometimes they're a customer of enterprise products and services. The relationship we've always had with Boeing in the open group has been as a customer, right? And um, so think of it now, we've got the customer side perspective to balance the other two. And a customer that is a huge organization, they, they are the organization that uh, inspired the vision of boundaryless information flow along with EADS and some other transportation companies. We, we did a round table with some CIOs from a number of these companies and in fact, if you look at the slides we use to describe boundaryless information flow and the breakdown of the silos, when I do that, those slides were provided to, to us by the Boeing company. TJ is a senior enterprise arch IT architect. Uh, he's co-chair of the Platform 3.0 Forum. He provides technical expertise within Boeing and in the industry to enable strategic IT initiatives targeted to achieve competitive advantage by exploiting the use of cloud, social media, analytics, mobility, and other emerging technologies. Right. So to moderate the panel, um, we have Dave Lounsbury. And Dave Lounsbury is, um, I can't remember. <laughs> Dave is the Vice President and CTO of the Open Group, of course. He's been with us for many, many years. Um, very well respected in the industry. Um, very little else to say about Dave. And he's going to do all the moderation stuff. So I'm going to get out of the way. Please welcome our panel. Well, thank you, Alan, for that great introduction. And Ron, Andrash, DJ, thank you very much for participating in the panel. So. Um, so it was about a year ago, 2013, we started, seeing, we started seeing this concept of a third platform game currency with the Gartner reports and some of the others in the industry. And that when it started out, it was these broad concepts of, well, maybe it's big data, maybe it's mobile, uh, maybe it's cloud. So, 
Since then, has, has an industry consensus emerged on what the definition of a platform is? Uh, you know, is a coherent reference model coming out of the work of, that's been going on here and, and other places? And if so, what are the big pieces in that, and, uh, and how do you see them fitting together? Ron, you want to start us off? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I don't think there's a coherent reference model available anytime soon, but, but for sure the open group would be one of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the communities that could be working on such a definition. Uh, to me, what's much more important is, is that it's, it's truly a, um, a revolutionary step forward, which you can only compare to, to, to um, the emergence of the mainframe first, and then the PC second. Everybody knows that the revolution that came with the PC and client-server architectures, um, you know, democratized access to information and technology, and, and it, um, you know, it brought us into an entirely new era of, of methodologies, uh, how we created solutions, who were creating solutions, I think is very important, because the departments and the business units could do it themselves. We all know, by the way, what it, what it could lead to. So I'm not saying that was uh, an easy revolution or something, but, but it was clearly a, a very important step. And, and to me, the, the real significance of, of the third platform is exactly the same. We're now entering an era in which uh, we see that different parts of the organization start to embrace IT once more. We see a uh, unmatched enthusiasm for technology, by the way, at the business side of organizations nowadays. Not necessarily for IT people, by the way, but certainly for IT. Uh, so, so that's, uh, that's in itself a revolution, but, but I think you can only compare it with, with, with when the PC came in terms, of, in terms of entirely new ways of, of creating solutions, entirely new places within the organization, how you do it, uh, entirely a new generation of, of tools that you do it, and, and, and a multitude of, of applications and solutions which cannot even be compared to what we've been doing in the past few years. So, so maybe the definition is not that interesting, but, but we're clearly in an era now, in sort of a revolutionary uh, point in time right now, which I think is the real essence of the third platform. Thanks. The democratization point's an interesting one. We'll come back to that. Andres, uh, what's, what's your view on Well, I think we need to decompose your question, right? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, a, uh, a, a reference model, um, uh, I don't think I would agree with everything that uh, Ron said, first off, that we're uh, evolving towards a better understanding of what we mean by Platform 3.0. But a reference model evolves from uh, a set of observable reference architectures. So what is a reference architecture? A reference architecture is a repeatable pattern that has uh, been seen to work in the field over and over again successfully uh, and then we create a, a logical representation of that uh, so that it helps guide uh, implementation of, of uh, future systems. And then a, a reference model is kind of a higher conceptualized version of, of reference architectures uh, to characterize uh, a platform or a set of architectures. Um, do we have a, an agreed upon consensus on exactly what that looks like right now. I think we have an inkling of where we're going, um, how, it, how it somewhat fits together. Um, I think that we wouldn't have a Platform 3.0 forum if we didn't uh, have lots of work to do here. Um, so one of the things we do have to do is we have to go down to the, uh, the observable, um, create those reference architectures, and continuously ask the question if our reference model uh, it is valid, or reference models in many cases might be. I offered one, um, uh, you know, kind of a nascent uh, reference model in my blog. That was in the blog post, right? Right. That was a great post. I, I actually no, liked thanks. the uh, concepts quite a bit. Then we come back to saying a few more about what was in that. But I'd like to hear TJ's view yeah, on, I, on where we are and yeah, how so, it's coming together. So I, I think uh, we have a fragmented models. It's not really a coherent model right now. We are working towards that. And most industries and other areas are also trying to get into that aspect. And I do agree that we don't have that fully reference model defined yet, and that's the uh, space we are working towards. Okay. I notice nobody's been bold enough yet, anyway, to talk about what, what the big pieces you see are coming into that. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as, you know, what are the broad blocks of, of what's going to end up in, in such a platform? 
Well, I, I, I did propose a few, right? So, uh, I, and I think that even since the eight weeks or nine weeks ago that we started, you know, kind of trying to work together to create a, a, a white paper and, and, and uh, have this discussion in the forum, that there has been even some, you know, changes in, in some perceptions. So let, get, let me give you an example. I suggested uh, that, and it was pretty well defined, you know, we un all understand that, you know, the transactional systems and the core business capabilities must continue to exist, and that's kind of like the crown jewels of, the, of our business processes within our enterprise or organization. Uh, and, uh, and those are systems of records. And the, the new, you know, uh, evolving platform is the mobile platform where the, you know, it's, it's a system of engagement. It's capturing information. It's, it's the uh, user interface uh, as well as a new computing platform in and of itself. And so there's that piece. And then you have the Internet of Things, which is, uh, you know, sensor-based uh, pervasive computing. All three of these things are coming together, you know, enabled through big data. But, you know, for example, recently, um, both IBM and, and HP started calling, you know, the big data piece systems of insight. Now, I, I personally think that, you know, a system of insight, uh, you have a system of insight that is associated with a business capabilities, but you don't have just one system of insight. Ron, TJ, reactions on that? I, I just have the feeling that it's not the real essence of, uh, of, of, of what we would call the third platform. By the way, I would tend to, uh, just, just, for, just for the record, I, I would tend to uh, give a little more, bit more credit to IDC in all of this. Mm -hmm. We're talking a lot about the nexus of forces and, and this, this Gartner categorization of applications. Yeah. I, think, I think IDC actually um, introduced the notion of the third platform. That's correct. And, and there's, there's the real essence to me. First platform, mainframe, second one, PC, sure. two big revolutionary areas. Mm -hmm. Third one, right happening right now. Uh, which is not necessarily what, what type of system is it actually, and, and are we interacting or engaging, or is it insight? But, but the very fact that, that there's an explosion of solutions, and, and that the way that we create them, much closer to the business, I would say, in general, uh, with a much shorter life cycle, typically, uh, and, and a much higher degree of, connect, of being connected, is, is much more the essence of, of what you call this, this third platform. So, so if we start to, uh, to reference model ourselves to death, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it actually will not really help us. Uh, it, it, we really need to understand that the revolution that's currently uh, uh, going on. Why, why actually are people in the business nowadays once more enthusiastic about IT? But would typically say, these damn IT people, we don't care for them. But we do love IT. We do love what we can do with technology. I think that's the real question that we need to answer. Uh, and, and what we should do from, from an IT industry perspective to, uh, let's say, change that uh, attitude a little bit. It's not, not just what's being done, but how we're doing it. Yeah. TJ? Yeah, so I think uh, if, we, if we need to put some you know, phrases, I would think like there may be some kind of guidance for architectures mm -hmm. and possibly looking into how semantic interoperable information would be flowing across the enterprise or as well as across the ecosystems, uh, you know, in different industry areas. And then some kind of like a maybe uh, coming back to the reference model or some mm -hmm. kind of a standardization of uh, you know, exchange information exchange would be a, a good thing to have to really make these things more coherent in terms of it. So I would think like if you work on that areas and providing those kind of guidance and making this more like a, and the last part I forgot about the security aspects. Because when we're talking about all this machine or human and all other things that need to work together mm -hmm. to really provide an actionable information to a right person, and that needs to be worked very hard from the beginning. Wouldn't it be nice to, to turn the perspective a little bit around? So, so you're talking from the, uh, the, the, open, you know, the open platform 3.0 uh, perspective, but, but you mentioned already a lot of different areas that I think are, are um, you know, um, um, delegates over here from all of these forums over here in the, in the room as well. So, so you mentioned security, which I think rightfully so. We've already been talking architecture. And by the way, TOGAF 9, splendid, uh, big asset, uh, industry standards. Is it fit? Is it fit for the first platform? Or has, has it been designed for the first and the second? I tend to think so. So, so architecture question, uh, what does it mean? Then, then, of course, competencies. 
So, so let's say certif certification. We've created these certifications for IT specialists and architects uh, in the era of the first and the second platform. So yet another question. Um, then security. We should ask probably security people, how do you deal, uh, how do you cope with, with these new challenges of the third platform? So, so my, my, uh, my, my uh, hypothesis would be that there are very few uh, forums uh, over here today that wouldn't be impacted by, by, um, by the notion of the third platform. So the question would be uh, how much should we actually do in the, in the working group and, and how much, to what extent should we actually invite each and every working group or forum to engage in this thinking because it's, it's literally a new era. I, that I we're almost entering. think that we ought to be the requirements gathering you know, forum for, the, uh, for yeah. the whole, right? I do think that there are some things that we could do within Platform 3.0 ourselves, <laughs> but you're absolutely 100% correct. I mean, integration and architecture go hand in hand, and I yeah. think the piece that you know, we are missing is how do you actually make all of this cohesively work together? It's not about a new platform for computing. It's what you—it's all the new business capabilities that you can achieve through adopting this new platform. Yeah, that's the essence. And uh, and so then you can uh, you know then go a step further and, and work on security and and if you understand mm -hmm. integration or how things fit together, then you can secure them. I, I I personally don't think you can just apply security concepts without understanding how pieces fit together. I think that. You know, one comes before another. But, but the hypothesis is, of course, that, that security will have an entirely different dimension in, in the world of this third platform because yeah. we designed it to, to thrive in the, in the era of the first and the second, and, yeah. and maybe it would be a serious inhibitor the way we look at security. I agree. Um, uh, if we're moving towards the power of this third platform. And that's a question we need to ask ourselves, I think, each and every individual, probably in this room as well, in terms of the era that I'm particularly involved in. Uh, to what extent is it affected? by what's currently happening and what uh, will be happening very soon. Since you mentioned questions, don't forget this card's on all the tables. We do want to take questions from the audience a little bit later on. I'm sure I'm going to run out of questions before too long. So uh, please get yours ready. Um, Ron, you, you mentioned something that I'm, I'm kind of interested in, and that is that, that pace of, of innovation that's going on in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. you know, you see not just the technology news about you know new data handling and new analysis tools, which kind of go more along with the the evolution of the the systems of record development that's always been in IT, but you also see the things that are closer to the edge, um, you know, particularly in the uh, the Internet of Things space. You see new devices and and to me, most interestingly, new platforms coming out every day, right? And one of the interesting characteristics of these is all of them are designed to dramatically lower the barrier to bringing pieces together. That, you know, particularly the frameworks you see in the Internet of Things space um, is really kind of pushing that out to the edge or lowering the, the barrier on that. So, um, so the great news here is there's, there's all this innovation and that really drives progress quickly. Um, but uh, Andras, your, your blog said uh, the, the hallmark of a successful enterprise systems architecture is a standardized and stable platform. And it seems like this, you know, this pace of change that, that Ron's alluded to brings us anything but that, right? So, um, well, the initial shift always brings a little chaos, right? <laughs> yeah. and, so, and, but you do have to have some of that mm -hmm. you know, stability in yeah. order to recognize it as a formal platform. So, so you know, how, you know, since we're, the Open Group is an organization that does standards, whether they're standards for technology, but also standards for how people do things, you know, like TOGAF methodology, right? So how do you see those coming together? Do you see that as the, either of those as the, the proper role for where the Open Platform 3.0 form is heading? Me or Ron? Uh, whoever wants to. It's not exactly start. clear who you're looking yeah. at. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm looking down who the wants line. That really, really. We're going to have the whole panel weigh in on uh, us. Uh, so I, I, I think that let's talk about um, you know how some of these companies who are you know our members are contributing to this kind of pivot and, and inflection. I think innovation is really important. I think when you talk about standards, you have to talk about interoperability. Um, to me, one of the great assets of the Open Group is the work that we do around architecture patterns, best practices. 
um, and helping facilitate the entire industry moving forward to to a level of maturity that is um, you know necessary and sufficient for all of us um, so I don't I don't think that you can start off the conversation with saying we need to standardize I think we need to understand the areas uh, that need you know some uh, uh, hand-holding and some facilitating so that we can actually realize the innovation around this new platform because we don't want to slow it down we want to actually facilitate it and I think that the the way in which we're actually building technology these days is uh, is slightly different than in the past and you can't talk about standardization before you actually realize that innovation a different different how can you expand yeah. a little bit well, I, you know, if you look at, out in the, uh, you know, the cloud world, you have so many different languages, I mean, uh, so many different ways of actually uh, developing solutions. If you look at I Instagram, for example, that company went through some 20 so some odd iterations of their platform architecture. Um, and, and it was very rapid over a period of time. Uh, and they did a lot of innovation themselves uh, to get to the next iteration. Um, so they couldn't really standardize. Um, they were actually, you know, in a, you know, in the wild west, really, you know, trying to do something very new and innovate, innovative. So if you look at it from that perspective, um, a lot of uh, the new solutions around platform 3.0 have never been tried before. Right, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you integrate the Internet of Things through business processes and capability, and provide you know dynamic machine-to-machine -machine, uh, interaction, uh, you know you simply just can't start off with a conversation of standardization. You have to, you do have to help everybody understand what are the best practices, what has worked, and and actually help us define. Uh, what it is those reference architectures models are, and then that can feed into the other points that you made, Ron. Hold this. I want to ask, because TJ is our, our co-chair, I want to see, you know, how, how do you see the, the work of the, the group evolving, given what we've heard about the, the pace and, and position? Yeah, I, I think we, we got a head start, actually, and we have certain areas where we actually kind of matured in terms of uh, defining how we're going to provide data in a way that it could be used across the, you know, different places, mm -hmm. and and also security is also we we actually worked on it with the forum and trying to work together to really address new concerns business has and also you know other areas where we need to really make sure that it is very robust and doing some kind of a ways to really analyze upfront. So if we, if we take that head start and keep on moving towards it, uh, I think uh, you know, we will get better off in terms of defining the reference architecture and really standardizing things in such a way that it would be used across mm -hmm. our member organizations and beyond that. So I, I believe, truly believe that uh, we are working towards that and it's a good way to really uh, go forward with it instead of just really over analyzing uh, you know the current things we are hearing about nexus of forces for a long while almost three four years mm -hmm. and no other uh, you know consortium is really working towards creating these kind of uh, standards so I think that's yeah, a unique good way. role here yeah yeah and, and, and we might want to do better than we did when the PC came, which was the second platform, because we all know that it you know, ended up for many years, arguably even until today, in, in, a, in a, a you know, chaotic disaster, a bit because everybody started to do their own things. And, and it was great, it was the democratization of technology, and everybody was enthusiastic about it, but it went all different ways. And it took us decades, literally, in the IT industry to clean up the mess that we created ourselves, by the way. And, and I think we could do better right now uh, by being uh, much more proactive in, in terms of the type of platform services you would be supplying from, from the IT perspective to, to this new aspiring world around you, probably in many cases business driven, and, and be much more proactive in terms of what services will be supplying to that world so that they can quickly, in an entirely new rhythm, build the next generation of solutions while bridging uh, what we have uh, in the back office or, or what we have in our existing uh, systems, which, which I think is one of the, the biggest issues we have to, uh, to tackle. Um, standardization, by the way, goes hand in hand with innovation, I, I sincerely believe. So standardization is very good for innovation. 
uh, you need to create a, a highly standardized platform to your point uh, because only then you can let it go and, and go all sorts of different directions. If you don't have that highly standardized platform, it also will go all directions but not orchestrated and, and again it will take us decades uh, to clean up the mess uh, which I don't think is a good idea. Well, you know, I, I work at the open group because before the open group I worked at a mini computer company who Kind of didn't make it. Mini computer revolution. So mini computer. Mini computer. That's mini nice. computers. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like sort a, of be between the, the first and the second young. platform. Mini computers. Is too oh, wait a minute here. I love it. Just, <laughs> just to add quickly here, uh, I think uh, I believe the technical problems are easy to solve than business problems. Mm -hmm. And looking into the business area, mm -hmm. so I think we have a good opportunity to really provide a platform at a technical level, which yeah. any enterprise or any uh, anyone can use to and make a business solutions mm -hmm. of it. So, well, I, I think one of the really important aspects of what we're going to do in the forum is actually be uh, the, uh, kind of a center of gravity for gathering requirements for the industry and reflecting them back out. Uh, in actioning some of them here in the open group but you know our moniker in the open group is making standards work and we do a tremendous amount of, of leading standards you know in the industry as well as creating our own standards so I think that if we do the right job in the platform 3.0 environment especially since we're not going to be able to solve all the problems even in the forum itself other forums are going to participate we're really kind of you know, going to be doing a lot of documenting the requirements and gathering uh, case studies uh, and helping folks understand, you know, the current state of the art and what needs to change as well as suggesting, uh, you know, standards and, and such. Yeah. And it's not just, do you envision it not just being the technical standards but some of that process management? I know that the group has in fact looked at things like innovation management and, and those processes as well. Do you see that coming into it? DJ, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. if you look at IT for IT, for example, uh, yeah. the forum that was just launched mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, you could argue that part of that processes, the way that we look there, and that reference architecture is very much based on, on what we've done so far. But you already see some of the newer areas emerge there as well, like DevOps, which, which is a sheer necessity. Yeah. DevOps in terms of a, a continuous delivery. And, and development cycle which is completely entwined because otherwise uh, you know you have the gap and that's already too much of a you know of, of a difference with, between two uh, areas within the entire life cycle so you see an entirely new rhythm already uh, created uh, over there which which you could argue is fundamentally different from the way that we've been looking at life cycles so far so so it has an impact on methodology I think and our own core processes uh, just as much. Yeah, I think it has a huge impact on architecture and methodology and enterprise architecture because there's a bit of an impedance mismatch um, when you look at these different classes of systems. You know, you have, if you have established sensor network um, and you've already architected that solution, then the data flow can certainly be used in, you know, to, uh, within a, a system of insight, analyze to shunt to some sort of system of record and business process informing that, interacting with uh, you know, your end user on, on the mobile platform in the engagement environment, uh, and so on and so forth. But if you look at how CRM systems or ERP or you know, even the new EMM systems of the world uh, actually are architected and implemented, they, their rate and pace and change uh, and how their actually solution is slightly different uh, than the rate and, uh, of pay, pace and change that uses a DevOps model uh, in, in, the, uh, in the sense that many folks are using it on the cloud right now. So we're going to have to do a lot of work, I think, Ron, in order to ha figure out how we're going to you know, address all these different uh, rate and pace and change requirements in these different system types because they're not all, you know, all things being equal, they're not, right? Clearly, and, and, and in a new world, we might not even be speaking of requirements anymore because it's platform-based. We look at the catalog and what's in the platform, and that will drive our innovation processes. So in the end, if you look at Toka, for example, which has requirements completely central, 
you know, it's, it's, it's the, the center of the universe and then uh, we, the, we have the crop circles around it. If you think about it, may, maybe that even would completely change once you are on this, this, this new era of platforms. And you wouldn't even really be articulating requirements anymore, but you would be thinking maybe in terms of value scenarios you want to fulfill, and then immediately you turn to the platform and see how it can drive these value scenarios, which is a fundamentally different way of looking at it uh, than, than, than the requirements first way of thinking. So, so and, and it's, this is really a holistic issue, I think, that, as I said, which needs to be addressed, I think, in each and every forum and working group of the, uh, of the open group, rather than, than, than uh, solely in the, in the open platform 3.0 area. Yeah, I, I think we, we actually based our foundations, for example, those uh, cloud computing uh, you mm -hmm. know, work group we have, we had some standards made on that one. Big data work is also going on in the platforms, and then Security Forum is doing, helping us to do that. And IT for IT, we are looking into how we can make this platform, or in a way, to provide a service model on on these platforms. So it could be very mm -hmm. innovative and agile way to really produce new business mm -hmm. solutions. So we are working towards doing that. So you know, all members are really um, encouraged to you know provide us some guidance and requirements so we can actually address them properly. So. I want to ask two more questions and I want to pull on this theme of moving you know, things beyond the enterprise, moving things out to the edge. Um, one of which I'm going to have to come back to you, Ron, and ask you, you mentioned uh, machine to machine interaction. Ron, Ron, Ron Andros it. actually so, so, so I'm concerned not everybody in the room will know quite what you meant by machine to machine interaction, what's your definition of it? And you know how does this? I think we probably always had machine-to-machine -machine interaction, but how does the, the growth of machine-to-machine -machine interaction um, affect what you know needs to be in the platform or the way we view the platform? And does it drive other uh, things coming in, like you know more automation or even dare we say cognition going on as part of the platform? So, Ron, uh, how what what does machine-to-machine no, but it's, it's definitely, again, um, of course we've always had machine-to-machine -machine, uh, connection, but you could say in terms of, of the technology as it currently emerges, uh, essentially almost any, anything could have intelligence and be connected uh, to other things, and, and it's, it's one of these explosions that actually make the third platform revolution right now. So, so, so uh, we're not stuck anymore at, at PCs or something, but the things might be the, the very incarnation and visualization of information, right, might, might be through these uh, things. And of course they'll be interconnected as well. Uh, everything could be a sensor, uh, so it would be providing us with input and stimuli, but equally anything could be uh, a tool to, to engage with and communicate and, and actually access information as well. And, and, and I think the sheer size of that, the, the magnitude of, of that, uh, we clearly cross the bridge as well, and, and, and uh, that, that makes for an explosion in the number of uh, applications, the number of solutions, uh, the number of connections. And that's something we need to address and something we've never seen before because this is entirely new to the industry. We've never seen such a diversity. TJ, you want to Yeah, respond? actually I was just probably going to quote something from either, I think it was from Gartner or Forrester, I'm not sure, but by 2017, I think they were predicting the machines would be doing more process, uh, learning than doing the processing. Uh, so uh, it's, they're going to be more smarter as they go <coughs> forward sure. and they're just going to help us make decisions whether, you know, uh, you know how you program uh, in that way to make more algorithmic, uh, you know, processing done upfront so human interactions would be a little bit less than actually machine is taking uh, actions on behalf of uh, humans and, and trying to make sure that it, it still have the checks and balances there so you're not doing something which is totally out of bounds. So, you know, to really speed up the, uh, what I call, uh, activities as well as making decisions uh, those machines would be doing more uh, what you call a learning than processing. Andrew? Well, I mean, machine-to-machine -machine interaction really kind of, to me, refers to uh, you know, pervasive computing, the use of sensor networks, and the interaction between devices in a way that 
uh, as TJ and Ron have, have suggested, uh, that they're making uh, you know, uh, decisions uh, based on models uh, without human interaction. Um, and if you look at OSIM level seven, uh, if you go back to a, a, you know, the service integration maturity model, which really the, the open platform three is, is uh, kind of based on, and you know, the foundation, as TJ suggested, really is service-oriented computing, cloud computing, and so on and so forth, and all of the uh, integration techniques that we used uh, and worked on here in the open group uh, for such a long time. We didn't just forget them. This isn't a shift away from that. You know, uh, just like all technologies, uh, we kind of stand on the back of the last uh, rev. Uh, but it's important to realize that, you know, when we're talking about machine-to-machine -machine interaction, we're talking about dynamically reconfigurable business processes and capabilities. So if you look at um, how this will work, you, you will have an in-context change in how the business process flows. So, for example, if you have a, you know, a situation where you have a, set, a sensor net, you know, signals to your in infrastructure and your systems of record that, uh, let's say, you have a certain reduction in uh, your, your supply chain or you have a degra degradation of the devices that are deployed into the field, you know, you have the old uh, use case of Caterpillar using all the devices in, in you promise and, it, you know, uh, I think that's a really good example of how that you would then refresh the, the supply chain and restart manufacturing for those components that are actually yeah. going to have to be replaced in the future, and that's an example of it. Yeah. Well, that, that's actually a good example because it leads into the, the next question, and we're going to take questions from the floor again. So if you do have them, make sure you, you hand them into, I guess, Lauren's collecting, uh, Chris. Good. Plenty of questions from the floor. Um, so I better leave plenty of time, but I got to get one last question in. I'm going to put the spotlight on TJ, which is that we we see a lot of interest in this new platform and machine-to-machine -machine communication or IoT from the manufacturing sector. And uh, there was an article, um, uh, and of course the groups got good roots in that, as, as uh, Andras has said, you know, with the uh, uh, open data format and the open open messaging interface IoT standard. So it was really good to see that the group is moving aggressively into that area. So um, the, um, the Technology Review published the article on uh, GE's transformation around IoT, they, which they called their million dollar software bet, just to be you know, a little provocative. But from a manufacturer's perspective, how do you see that impacting what, what you do? Yeah, it, uh, I think uh, GE is uh, spot on there. I think they're talking about 1% uh, of you know billions of dollars they have it in the equipment and all area. If they save one percent of it, like you save a lot. Yeah. Uh, in terms of manufacturing wise, we are looking into three different areas: um, new business opportunities, looking into different areas, adjacent areas, trying to figure out how this platform would provide us that one, and then uh, business optimizations like reduce cycle time, doing things a little bit faster, quicker, and better. You know, security uh, is also concerns uh, in all other areas to making sure, you know, we are doing things uh, properly. And then also operational optimization. Operational optimization I'm talking about in terms of compliance related things and doing things uh, total cost of ownership in terms of uh, <coughs> putting uh, less uh, operational cost to, you know, to the enterprise. So. All these areas actually helping us by using uh, these new convergence of technologies and doing things a little bit better and faster. Yeah, but, but if you think quick, about it, quick uh, reactions, then we'll cut. The yeah, well, if you think about it, uh, products themselves that you manufacture actually become platforms themselves. Be because uh, if, if you would be able to access them through APIs and services, as, as a real platform would be, there would be lots of additional services and products, connected or not, around it, that, that would make the, uh, the product itself much richer, right? So the product itself is still nice, it's an intelligent thing maybe, but actually the notion of the fact that it itself would, would create a platform that would attract others, uh, would be very interesting. And, and let's not forget, by the way, the notion of a platform is that it's attractive to others. Because if you're not attracted to a platform, nobody, you know, uh, will use it. It's not really a platform. As Marshall Van Alstyne talked about that. Well, yeah, so, so how to create something that actually is attractive to, uh, to link up to 
and donate to or, or contribute to or use it. That's, that's the real essence of a platform, I think. Yeah. And it's very um, notable, I think, in manufacturing as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's where products are going. Totally agree. Products become platforms. Yeah, the factory automations and all other areas where things would be, you know, you would do product, it's more like we putting uh, everything, it would be more uh, what you call intelligence. So how yeah. they share in, uh, information from one product components to another. Our airlines are doing that anyway, or airplanes are doing that already. So Plane, we can find platform other areas. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so. Andres, quick, very quick reaction on, on that? I think these guys pretty much said that oh, all. Good. <laughs> well then let's uh, move on to uh, questions from You're the welcome. audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chris, my colleague, Dr. Chris Harding, who is the forum director for the Platform 3.0 forum, will be asking the questions. Thank you, Dave. And uh, we've got quite a few questions. Um, one, actually, that uh, I'll read out, but I suggest we don't answer it because you've already said quite a bit about this, but just to reinforce the fact that it's a point that uh, people are saying are, in, are important. If the service catalogue is the fulcrum between IT and the business, the choice for humans uh, or systems to select capability, service or platform, where is the service catalogue in your discussions? And I think you've, you've said a little bit about that already. So maybe the person who asked that, if they want to pursue it further, could uh, discuss um, during the break. Um, that was the easiest question I ever answered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so um, Build that one. Ever? to move on to one that I don't think we've discussed yet, isn't the essence of Open Platform 3.0 a change from using my IT, my data, my apps, my tech, to using others' IT, public data, open apps? Is that what we're talking about? Uh, no, I mean, I think that uh, that's a really uh, you know, important concept around cloud, right? And the fact that you know you had, I think, several individuals yesterday talk about how uh, the hybrid environment is going to be pretty much the future environment, right? Um, so absolutely, you're going to be using other endpoints that provide, uh, you know, a business process when you add it up. You know, a, a set of capabilities in your business. So using TOGEF, you know, you map your business capabilities down to IT function. If you look at it from that perspective, yes, you're going to see a series of services that are not just contained within your own environment. But, you know, quite frankly, you know, different organizations are going to approach this differently. It depends on the situation, the business process, and the capability that you're trying to, uh, to solve as to how many of these, you know, hybrid endpoints or uh, external endpoints that you're going to be using. So, um, yes and no. <laughs> Yes and no. What is your I, I would. I don't think uh, any organization or enterprise would be putting things onto a public place, uh, especially their intellectual property. So uh, that's where the security concerns comes in. So uh, you know. So there would be something my which would be more private. You know, model deployment model for enterprises to do things in a way and. You don't see like Apple is announcing something, you know, what they're going to do in the next platform for iPhone or iPad and all of that. So all those things, research and development still going to be, you know, privately and, you know, you know it's not going to be public. So. But, but having said that, you, you, you want to be able to do these type of things because you're, you're using other platform stuff uh, to do the things that you used to do yourself in the past so that you have the room available to do these things that really matter and make a difference. And, and there is a change. I, I, I truly believe, as we discussed, that there will be less um, interest in requirements sooner or later. Requirements are yours. I want, you know, requirements. And, and actually you're saying, here's the platform, I can use this stuff. And, and this will be uh, where I start from. And uh, the hell with these requirements. Uh, and it's, 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 I'm building on it. Uh, to make something which is me. Uh, but in order to be able to do that, I, I must make the room and, and I will leverage whatever is in the platform, in, in the service catalog, by the way, and, and in the open APIs, and in the data markets, and, and all of the other things that might be part of that platform and use it to kickstart myself uh, on my way through where I really am and, and what, what makes me different. No, I, 
you know, I think that if you take a TOGAF point of view, you look at your core competencies. If your core competencies don't include certain elements like HR management, a lot of companies are outsourcing their HR and uh, organizational support systems to companies like, you know, for example, IBM Conexa. And those are all cloud-based solutions that are integrated in with your key core capabilities. So really, it goes back to that enterprise architecture. What are your core capabilities? What can you outsource? And TG, I totally uh, agree that those family jewels are going to stay in the castle. But, but you should reverse the thinking a little bit, right? You're talking about HR services. Um, outsourcing used to be, here's how I did my HR process. You please run it for me, outsourcing party. Right. Run, run my mess for less. Uh, but actually nowadays, uh, you know, no, no, but, okay, well, and, and, but nowadays it's much more catalog based. Right. So, so here's a set of highly standardized AR pro uh, HR processes. They are delivered from the cloud, multi-tenant software. Everybody agrees that it's uh, best industry, uh, best practice, uh, industry best practice in terms of HR, why don't we use that? It, until they actually begin to use your process and dictate to you that you have to make changes that are necessary for them. Because they are still <laughs> in the I require yeah, so era, uh, I yeah. require. Because exactly. every company and organization well, that's has the point. A, a different business model. Right? They think so. Yeah, they think so. They think so. We should probably move on to other questions. So we get to at least two questions here. Okay. So um, let's go on to the next question. And I suspect the answer to this question is simply going to be no, but there could be some interesting oh, things to yeah. say about it on the way. So the next platform will be highly distributed. Do you think we have a robust model to handle distributed transactions? I mean, Who we certainly have that? standards for, for, you know, transaction management with web services and, and uh, you know, the whole web infrastructure is based on a, a bus architecture in a way. So for me, I mean, I don't have a problem with that, architecting solutions that manage, uh, you know, distributed transactions. Uh, M MQTX, for example, is an open source solution that some vendors are actually supporting, you know, additional, you know, uh, support for we are. That's a good example of, of a transactional solution that can coordinate multiple two-phase commits, you know, across the internet. TJ? Uh, so, I would take a little bit slight different approach here, or maybe I uh, just wanted to give another opinion. Uh, Internet is kind of based on stateless, and it's not a reliable thing. So, uh, and when you're getting so much of data, uh, transactional aspects really come in a way. So you have to build your architecture and systems in such a way that you expect the failures. So transactional uh, would eventually happen, uh, you know, as it, uh, what we call it in the autonomy and all of those things. So yes. those things would happen at eventual time, but it's probably not going to be the norm, you know, when we're looking for so much data coming in, needs to process it quickly, and you would actually expect there may be some, you know, it doesn't really get transmitted or uh, it, it just didn't really. So we have to accommodate that, so. I, I, I mean, it does, it's not lost on me because I have a lot of different customers with different uh, kind of profiles. But TJ, you are a, you you represent Boeing, and and I, and I know Boeing is a fairly conservative organization. So I would say that you, you know it sounds like a lot of your processing you're not going to be outsourcing to other you know providers. You're going to be creating this you know environment within your infrastructure. Is that true? Is it? We're still looking for hybrid, so we're still going to have something on the public environments, which is not public-public, but community-based. You know, mm -hmm. so you still know who is going to be there, and also, and there are some public solutions which would be there. You know, but it all depends upon what information and what data you're sharing. You know, what model is really uh, best suited for that? So uh, we have so many use cases for different deployment models. So. Chris? Chris? I think we probably have time for one, one more. One more, you think, not two? We'll, 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 we'll see. <laughs> okay. The, the, remember, that was the question you thought if, there would be just a no to. If we can say yes or no, that would be a good question. <laughs> so, there's one I've been saving for last. I'll go to that one. Um, in Open Platform 4.0, will the computers be architecting how humans will be used? What? <laughs> say it again, sorry. I didn't get that. 
This is where the computers be So, so I guess they're they're asking for you know if you look beyond platform 3.0, you know what would you see on the horizon? Is the way that I interpret that question. Um, I, I think cognitive computing will certainly be, uh, a, a, you know, a, a a very important evolving future element of uh, of whether it's platform 3.0 or the next iteration. Who knows? Um, certainly, that is. Uh, a situation where you ha have machines making some decisions based on models that that may reduce the n amount of human interaction. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, I really can't, you know, predict. I, I hope to be retired by then anyway, <laughs> so probably couldn't care less. So. <laughs> it be on the, yeah, no, really, I'm not. <laughs> on the Riviera, right? Yes, for sure. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> the robot bringing you drinks. <laughs> PJ? No, I, I, I think the possibilities are there, but I don't think we are there yet, so. <laughs> One of the studies I saw on, on that, that point said that the, 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 the skills that would survive would be the ability to show compassion, bring people together, establish consensus, and things like that. So I think we're probably all good for a few minutes. Sounds like the open group. group. Yeah. I could do that from the Riviera as well, yeah. by the way. <laughs> right. So. We will have the remote access. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we've got maybe three more no, minutes. Another, another question or so? Okay. Yeah. Um, how will Open Platform 3.0 be relevant to current platform providers and consumers? What would be the incentive to adhere to the standard? So I don't see this as, any, as a one standard kind of... Um, you know, approach. You know, look look at it from this perspective. Was there one standard when we talked about the monolithic mainframe? Well, there were fewer, certainly. Uh, there were many more in the internet PC phase that Ron, you know, cited, and there will probably be many more patterns in in the uh, Open Platform 3.0 era as well. So there won't be just one, and the incentive will actually be to support you know the the business capabilities of integrating the mobile environment systems of engagement, the internal core transaction systems, the, uh, the, those systems of insight that support all of these different uh, capabilities, and of course the Internet of Things as, as we begin to integrate these you know, sensor environments and pervasive computing into the, into the core business mission. TJ, on thoughts? Well, from an IT perspective, you, you want to be prepared for whatever will be coming to you. You want to be more proactive, uh, so you want to be able to, uh, to, to establish a, a set of services and, and, and platform. And, and I think the best way to get there is to kickstart it based on, on uh, what the industry, in terms of open standards, is producing. That would make a lot of sense. Although, of course, there will be quite a lot of individuals, no doubt, that will create their own um, uh, perspective on, uh, on platform 3.0, which is fine, but, but I think it would make a lot of sense uh, for, to, to do a kickstart and to have for a change a proactive position, um, because the, 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 the things are clearly shifting. And uh, as I said, uh, at the era of the PC, many IT people were for years in denial in terms of you don't need anything else and the mainframe, the PC is rubbish. Or wait a minute, we can run a spreadsheet on our mainframe as well. I actually saw it happen. I'm, I'm that old. Um, but, but with the third platform, you, you might envision the same, right? And, and, uh, and so, so you're hoping not to make the same mistake again and be much more proactive and be actually part of that movement rather than in denial uh, for too long. TJ, final thought? Yeah, I, I think uh, the platform 3.0 work we are doing, uh, we are trying to strive for making more agile and, uh, you know, adaptive to not only this nexus of forces uh, technologies, but other technologies that may come forward in the future. So we wanted to make it more agile and, and as well as, you know, making sure it's adaptable to what the existing systems and things are um, in each organization. So we, we want to make sure that it is more interoperable, it's semantically uh, accurate, information's getting shared, so all those things would be a head start from our point of view to really uh, provide the platform related standard, which is stable, which is going to be stable than any other consortium is providing right now. So.
Yeah, I mean, all of these platforms still exist, though. I mean, the mainframe evolved, of course. the internet is evolving, PCs evolved to, you know, and we'll continue. I don't, nobody's going to see Microsoft, you know, you know, kick, you know, close their doors tomorrow. They're going to continue to to be part of the equation. They want to be a third platform champion as well. That's, That's just right. like IBM, I suppose. That's right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to move on. It sounds like there is uh, plenty of work ahead for the. Uh, open Platform 3.0 form, so please everyone who is interested in this, please see the staff or see the uh, leads on this uh, to get involved. Uh, TJ, Andras, Ron, thank you very much for participating and uh, we'll hand it back to Alan.